the papers are our course survey. It's green to match St. Patrick's Day. Please take a minute to uh, fill it out, jot down some notes. We love to hear feedback on our courses and to hear what is most valuable to you and your work so we can accommodate your needs and try to get speakers on the Hill that would really help you out. Um, also, handouts from today's presentations are available and uh, a new Mercatus on Policy um, pamphlet literally came off the presses this morning, so it's the first day that it's been released. So I hope you uh, find that helpful when you're looking at these issues a little bit further. Um, now I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Um, we have Jerry Brito and Jerry Ellick, who are both senior research fellows with the Mercatus Center. They both work on accountability issues and regulation issues and telecommunications issues, so they overlap in their work quite a bit. Uh, Jerry Brito has been focusing um, very much on government transparency as it relates to new technology and the use of the internet, however, and uh, Jerry Ellick is has become an expert on regulation and government accountability in general. And then we also are privileged to be joined by um, Morris McTeague, who is the director of the Government Accountability Program at the Mercatus Center. Um, previous to joining us in 1997, he was, at, he was a member of the New Zealand Parliament, minister and cabinet minister, and also served as an ambassador for New Zealand. Um, now he has uh, devoted his time to sharing his experiences with New Zealand and taking the lessons that he learned um, in that in that service um, and applying it to issues of government reform, government accountability, and government transparency today. So I will leave it to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Marian, and uh, pleasure to be back here on Capitol Hill once more. Um, I spent the last 10 years working on things like accountability and uh, transparency, and I've probably done that because the previous 10 years I spent being held accountable uh, and required to produce greater transparency all the time. Here's something that I'd just like to start off with because it does something about outlining the role of governments and I call them irrefutable truths, but many of you will debate them uh, if you get the opportunity. Uh, governments consume wealth, not create it. Um, and I think that that's important. But governments can actually do something about creating the climate for wealth creation to occur. Uh, and that's the role. And I like to describe it as the government should be the referee, uh, but not the player. Uh, and if you think about it in those terms, then I think you tend to get the role of government Clearer. Globalization is now an irreversible reality. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's been here for a long time. In fact, it's probably been here for 10,000 years um, before we got here. We can go back to things like the Yellow Silk Road and so forth. But globalization is the fact that communities trade with each other in a variety of different ways. Uh, in some cases, it's the sharing of information. In other cases, it's the sharing of goods and services. Uh, Decisions taken by one nation state have effects on other nation states. And I think as the Secretary of the Treasury found out in Europe this week, uh, that, or last week, that um, nation states will make decisions that suit themselves. Uh, but you have to be aware of the fact that the decisions that you're making may also have an effect in other places. One of the greatest examples of that in the last three decades, in my view, has been the mobility of capital. Capital moves around the world extremely rapidly today, uh, but we've also found out that jobs move almost as rapidly. So that uh, mobility is important. Here's something that probably shouldn't need stating, but needs to be stated in my view, and that is that capital investment precedes job creation. Uh, and sometimes when we get into circumstances like we have at the moment, there's a temptation uh, to want to do things that will create jobs. What you can actually do is that you can encourage the capital investment to occur, but that capital investment is what actually creates the jobs. You can create, make work jobs, but they're not permanent. And the ones that you really want for wealth creation are the ones that are inspired by long-term interest in being able to create uh, benefits. Uh, capital migrates to the friendliest environment it can find, uh, and capital and jobs are extremely mobile. So what are some of the things that create a capital attractive environment? Uh, they really are all around what I call certainties. Uh, and if we 
if we saw something that was a, that's a significant cause of the economic crisis that we're working through at the moment, it would be that that certainty disappeared. Nobody actually knew what assets were worth. Nobody knew where it was safe to invest their money. So what they did was that they stopped doing any of those things. And governments can do some things to actually help increase certainty. Uh, and some of the things that are, um, are really important, and I wrote some of this for dealing with countries that I work with, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, uh, issues of safety. Can you actually move about the community um, with confidence? Uh, is Can you actually build assets without them being destroyed or taken over by the government? The rule of law, can you depend upon the law? Uh, and uh, certainly that contracts are enforceable, that if you do a deal with somebody, uh, then you're able to see that that deal is executed. Uh, and it, also that property rights are secure. Um, just, I see a caution on the horizon and some of the activities that Congress is looking at at the moment in terms of issues of bankruptcy uh, it, it do infringe upon property rights. If I could just give you an example from my own country, in 1933, uh, the first Labour government in New Zealand passed something that was called the Mortgages Relief Act, uh, and what it did was that it actually wrote off third mortgages on people's property. Uh, what it actually did in effect was make a lot of people bankrupt, or make a lot of people uh, totally penniless. Uh, the vast majority of them were widows uh, and they never recovered it. Uh, one of the consequences of that was that it took the Labour Party 50 years to be able to get more than one term as the government of New Zealand uh, because it created a level of distrust uh, that people's assets or property weren't actually secured. Uh, certainly the competitiveness is considered certainty that competitiveness is considered before regulations and laws are passed, and the certainty that profits will be allowed to occur at a rate equal to or better than in other environments. If you don't do those things, what will happen is that very quietly the capital will go to one of the places. So, accountability. What's the big thing about accountability that's come up in, in, in the last 10 years? Well, the more open and transparent government activities are to public scrutiny, the greater the public confidence there is in what the government's doing. And the greater the transparency of government processes and procedures are, the better the decisions and the lower the risk of any corrupt or inappropriate actions. Uh, but sometimes we get into these kind of debates without ever any clarifying what we're talking about. Uh, so what is accountability? Accountability is taking responsibility for the consequences of one's actions. It doesn't matter whether one's the government, or whether one's the head of the household, or the manager of the company, uh, or just any private individual. Uh, and it's not necessarily about monetary transactions, about the rest of your transactions as well. Uh, transparency is a component of accountability. We're seeing a lot of talk across the United States at the moment about transparency, and I think people are are thinking about it as a value in its own right. Uh, without transparency, there is no accountability. But it's transparency that actually gives you the ability to be able to put accountability in place. And I think that that's important that you remember that, that transparency is what enables us to make the decisions that would decide whether or not this was a good or a bad practice, whether or not this was a good or a bad result. Uh, so trans what's transparency? Transparency is a process that requires us to disclose fully and truthfully our performance to those who are entitled to know. And you can use that definition in any, any part of your life. But whether you're a minister with a congregation, whether you're a parent with your family, whether it's a spouse with their other spouse, uh, whether it's a golfer with their mates. Uh, probably not a golfer with their mates. Uh, but that whole process is that it requires you to disclose performance. But it also, no that statement takes for granted that you actually know what performance is. And the government in many instances, that's one of the missing components. We know where we spent money, we don't know what happened as a result. We don't know whether the benefit that we wanted when we uh, gave permission for that money to be spent was actually delivered. Uh, and that's one of the areas where government lacks accountability, in my view. Here are some things that I think are part of a good government agenda, just three of them. 
uh, a government that makes budget decisions based on results. Now, in my own personal life, I don't spend money on something unless I've got a pretty good understanding of whether or not it's going to give me the benefit that I want. Um, governments should think more carefully about is this money that we're going to spend on remedial reading going to lift the reading age of the target number of children? Uh, or is this particular policy going to be able to move people from dependency to independent living? Having a good measure of whether or not the expenditure is going to produce the result that you want. Uh, it goes without saying, therefore, to spend money on things if you don't know whether or not they work uh, is irresponsible. The second one, a government that is honest and truthful with future generations by requiring intergenerational reporting on current policy. What that really means is that we should be projecting government decisions much further forward uh, than we do at the moment. Uh, budgets should all give outlying years for 10, 15 and 20 years out. Because the consequences of government actions have a significant lag time and a long run time. Uh, and often you will find policies that look like they're good in the first three or four years, uh, but then the cost of them makes them problematic in the long term. So stretching accountability and transparency out for a much longer period of time, I think it's going to be one of the needs of the future. Uh, and a government conducting responsible budgeting by eliminating deficits and using surpluses to pay off accumulated debt. I'm going to touch on a few countries that have dealt with this issue. Uh, I don't know whether you know the statistics for the United States federal government, but in the last 50 years you've balanced the budget five times. Uh, if that was me, my bank would have sacked me rather than the other way around. Uh, and I think the same would be true for the rest of us. So the idea that deficits can be managed uh, into infinity is wrong. And we're going to have to grapple with that idea of how we get those things back in the line. Uh, so what would be good? I touched on one of them, results transparency, knowing the, risk, the effect or the consequences of the money that we spend. Financial and purchasing transparency, knowing exactly the state of the accounts. I believe that the United States federal government, about <coughs> two to three years from now, is going to start asking some questions about how did this mess happen without us knowing, and is going to bring them to looking at financial reporting, issues like using accrual accounting, uh, bringing liabilities onto the balance sheet, and having a much clearer picture of what not only the actual state of affairs is, but what are the risks out there as well. Uh, program performance and results transparency would be good, and if we do that in the right way, we should have the full public. Jerry Breed is going to talk to you about some of the things that happen when you put the right kind of information out in front of people, and they start to have debates about it and talk about it. We saw something yesterday that I think is an indicator of that, and that's the arguments around AIG. Uh, and if nothing happens about whether or not you can claw back the money, what will happen, in my view, is that chief executives will not be as lenient in the terms of performance payments in the future. I think they're going to learn that lesson and learn it hard. Okay, policy makers should make decisions, should, should know before they make decisions what the likely consequences of the decisions are on these four things. Uh, the intentions of future capital markets, what are investors going to do? The effect on existing businesses' ability to be able to compete, does it make it easier or harder? Uh, the effect on existing jobs, are you creating jobs or are you going to put existing jobs at risk? And the effect on the creation of future jobs. Are jobs going to occur here or are they going to be in Taiwan, in China or India? Here's what some other countries have done in terms of dealing with that issue that I just mentioned. About looking forward and saying to themselves, how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? In 1994, New Zealand passed something called the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and what it did was define in statute what's fiscally responsible behaviour. Uh, and one of those things was that the government wasn't to run deficits. Uh, and what it actually requires is that the government's going to go into deficit, it has to go to the legislature and get the permission of the legislature uh, to go into deficit. Uh, and doing that, it has to say what the reason is, how long they expect to be running deficits, and how, long, how they are going to repay the debt incurred and how long it will take. Uh, the result of that is that since 1994, no government in New Zealand has ever run a deficit. Uh, and in the process, it paid off virtually all of the national debt. Uh, so it's a debt-free country. 
the Australians in 1998 passed something called the Budget Honesty Act for pretty much the same reasons. Uh, and in Australia, they also have determined the fiscal responsibility is balancing the budget and they run surpluses for the last 10 years. They also have retired much of their debt. Uh, in Britain, 1998, the same, they passed something that was called the Code of Fiscal Stability. Uh, and that defined uh, that fiscally responsible behaviour was not allowing the national debt to be greater than 34% of GDP uh, and that the budget would balance on average. Uh, and they've done that for the last 10 years up to the current year. The current Prime Minister has just repealed the Code of Fiscal Stability uh, because he's gone outside it, uh, when he actually was the person who drafted it in the first place. Uh, Canada has done pretty much the same sort of thing uh, with its Accountability and Transparency Act, which has been in place now for about eight years. And Europe also did that with the Maastricht Treaty. We understand lots of the other things about Maastricht, but one of the things that Maastricht did as well was require a level of fiscal stability and responsibility for the countries of Europe. Except that it set fiscal uh, responsibility as deficits of no greater than 1% of GDP. The other countries made them surpluses, um, Europe made them deficits of no greater than 1% of GDP. Uh, in addition to that, we've got lots of places that are working on transparency laws. My colleagues will tell you the important thing about transparency that we're starting to learn from the research that we do is just get the raw information out there so that people can look at it, pick it up, use it, and, and put it together in whatever way they want. It doesn't have to be formatted in the way in which you think is appropriate. Let the debate occur, in my view, is the best way to go forward. Now, for some of those things that I've just talked to you about, the first slides that Jerry Alex show, shows you will indicate what's happened uh, to the bottom line of the number of the countries that have moved towards fiscal stability statutes of some kind or another. Thank you. Jerry? Okay, thanks, Morris. <coughs> well, as Morris indicated, I want to pick up where he left off. Mostly, uh, what I want to talk about is opportunities for improved transparency and accountability for results of the spending under the Recovery Act that was just passed recently. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about why should we care, why should we bother, you know, why now? Uh, you know, in these countries Morris mentioned, uh, they didn't move towards some kind of a fiscal responsibility uh, policy change which was usually coupled with an improvement in accountability and transparency as well. They didn't move to that simply because somebody said, gee, that's a good idea, never thought of it before, let's do it. Uh, but rather, uh, they typically did it as a result of some kind of a fiscal crisis where uh, policymakers in these countries realized that the deficits they were running were not sustainable and something had to change. In some cases, it may have been as drastic as you know, the nation, national government being almost cut off from world capital markets and unable to borrow further. In other cases, it might have been something more subtle, such as uh, you know some representative of major investor mentioning they were concerned about the safety of their investment. It doesn't happen with the U.S., but it does happen with other countries. Is anybody following with, with uh, Chinese? Prime? Yeah. Okay. Okay. But let, let's look at the pattern with. Pattern deficits, and these things are a little bit messy, but that's okay. Um, so the public policy, it's not, it's not a science, we know that. Um, but, let's, but let's take a look at what happened in uh, a variety of countries with deficits. If you look at deficit as a percentage of GDP, which helps you kind of get at the idea of whether it's you know, sustainable, a relatively small part of your, your, uh, your spending and a relatively small part of your country's production or not. Uh, but in the U.S. with you know, major trading partners, major industrialized democracies since 1980, um, you find that, in some ways, our experience with deficits has been similar. In other, way, in other ways, uh, it's been maybe a little bit different. Uh, it doesn't look like we've ever been in as bad a shape um, as uh, some of the other countries where UK... Morris, what year was the Fiscal Responsibility Act in the UK again? 98. Okay, 98. Notice that was preceded in the 90s by a big increase in the UK deficit as a percentage of GDP. So they kind of hit a wall and realized they had to do something. Uh, you know, U.S. was never in, in as bad a shape as, say, Italy was. Uh, but, you know, we actually look pretty good compared to, compared to some of these other countries. Another comparison, let's look at some of the countries that were known to, at one time or another, to have some very serious problems with debt. And this kind of runs 
runs the gamut from Belgium to New Zealand to uh, Italy and some others. And, you know, obviously compared to the countries that really had big bad problems, uh, the U.S., you know, isn't looking so bad either since 19. Uh, we can compare the U.S. to the Westminster countries. Uh, Morris mentioned Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, where they did some major uh, reforms, major fiscal responsibility reforms, because they, they felt they needed to. And uh, you know, the U.S. was never quite in as bad a situation as uh, the Westminster countries. Um, the U.K., New Zealand, Canada had all, all hit points where their deficits as a percentage of GDP were much bigger. Um, but uh, times are changing. If you look at the projected deficits in the president's budget, I mean, I'm not putting the blame on the president here because if you just looked at CBO's projections back in January before the budget even came out, it was similar, a similar picture based on policies in place as of January. If you look at projections for the future, uh, what we find is the U.S. is on track, at least for a few years, to have budget deficits that are as big as any of the big ones as a percentage of GDP. Uh, in a lot of these other countries, that then felt some sort of pressure for major uh, government reforms that tried to reduce deficits, promote fiscal responsibility, and promote accountability and transparency in order to try to make sure that the money that was being spent was being spent wisely. So now, I gave this talk one time and somebody, somebody said, oh, this looks really partisan. There's one message I don't want you to take away with this. Please don't think that I'm saying, well, gee, up to now our deficits have been fine, so we don't want to say that Reagan and Bush were bad guys, but now it's really bad uh, under President Obama. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not sure these other deficits that we've had up to now were really sustainable over the long term either. I'm not trying to draw a contrast between presidential administrations or congressmen. Congresses. I want to, all I want to point out is that the U.S., for the first time, is now having a deficit as large as a percentage of GDP as other countries, which then felt pressure for significant fiscal reforms, significant accountability reforms. So um, the silver lining in this cloud of big deficits is what we are likely to see in response is some kind of public pressure, political pressure, or a significant change in the direction of fiscal responsibility and accountability. And then we have to ask, well, you know, what, what the heck could agencies be held accountable for? If we want to hold agencies accountable for something to make sure that money is being spent wisely, what kind of things can we hold them accountable for? And there's a whole literature on this. People in public administration write about this. There are different things you can measure and hold agencies accountable for. One is inputs, the stuff that goes in, the dollars that people hire, the effort, the materials, uh, all the things that go into producing the services government provides. Another is activities. You know, did they spend the money we, we, uh, the way we said they should do it? Did, uh, did they make sure nobody stole the money? All that kind of thing. Another thing that could be monitored is outputs. You know, what kind of stuff did agencies produce or how much service did they produce? <laughs> but the final and most important is outcomes. What actual benefits uh, did the public receive as a result of the government activity? And outcomes is really the unique focus that the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993 brought to the table when looking at performance management of, of federal agencies. It's focus on, let's try to find out and measure or at least look at some indicators that tell us what kind of outcomes the activity is producing. Here are some examples of outcomes, and these are related to some of the things that are in the Recovery Act. Uh, if you're talking about, build, about building roads, well, some of the outcomes from building roads, the public benefit, are that you get less congestion or you get improved safety or you know, maybe you just get a, a pickup in economic activity because it's cheaper and easier to move stuff from one place to another. Um, you're going to do uh, retrofits on federal buildings and try to save energy. Well, gee, you have a, hopefully we'll have energy savings and some dollar savings there that are, that are the results of that. And on, and on down the road, hopefully the money we're spending on education is going to in some way improve educational achievement or improve something else that we, that we want our education system to produce. And so on down the line. So you can think about all the things that money is being spent on, and it's not that difficult, at least you know, conceptually, to think, yeah, here are the kinds of outcomes we're trying to produce with these expenditures. A number of the things, a number of the purposes listed in the Recovery Act do imply outcomes. Some do, some don't. Uh, but in regard to the infrastructure spending, there's language in the bill about long-term economic benefits that we hope to get from spending on infrastructure. Uh, there's some language 
indicating that some of the money spent on science and health is supposed to improve economic efficiency. That's the, the uh, computerized medical records and so forth. Um, there's a goal of assisting folks most, most uh, impacted by the recession. That in itself is more an activity, not exactly an outcome, but you can work your way through that to get to some definition of outcome in terms of getting people back on their feet, getting them back into employment and so forth. Uh, there's, there's, excuse me, some language about preserving state services, preventing tax increases. Again, that's more of an activity or, or an input, or, but you can, you can work from there to, okay, what are the ultimate results that we expect to achieve by doing those things? Uh, and, of course, the big issue that a lot of folks want to talk about is employment. Now, in the language of performance measurement, and you can go, and, and this is not a, this is not a political point in the debate over whether uh, the Recovery Act is a good idea. This is something that you will find in anything that's written about performance management in either businesses or federal agencies. Hiring people, people who are hired are input, not an outcome. Now, we're in a recession, so we want to know what are the employment effects of you know, any legislation we pass, of course. But, um, you know, as a matter of sort of, you know, basically how do you, how do you classify things, typically uh, folks who are employed are regarded as an input, and if you're measuring the number of people employed, you're measuring an input, you're not measuring an outcome. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, we have been promised, we the American people, have been promised that the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act would be carried out with full transparency and accountability. Well, what does full transparency and accountability look like? And um, what indicators can we look at to try to figure out how much transparency and accountability will there be and where are there opportunities to improve it in the Recovery Act? Not necessarily by writing new legislation, but just in the implementation. How could you implement it in a way that gets us more transparency and accountability? Well, let's divide it up by the three things that are in the Recovery Act. There are There is direct appropriations that are in the part of the bill called Division A. There is stuff that CBO refers to as direct spending that's in Division B. Uh, and then there are a bunch of tax law changes. Uh, and each of those, well, the, that lays out the, basically lays out the totals there. Let's look at each of those in turn. I'm going to start with appropriations, then go to the revenue provisions, and then loop back to talk about the direct spending. Appropriations. If you read the language in the bill, most of the accountability focus in the bill for the appropriations in that section in the bill that deals with accountability for appropriations is focused on uh, largely on measuring dollars spent, measuring projects completed, uh, and making sure nobody steals the money. And those are all good and important things, don't get me wrong. Um, but very little of that language focuses on outcomes. It's mostly focused on measuring the spending, accounting for the money, and measuring activity to make sure things are getting done quickly. And then it's, you know, a variety of other provisions like whistleblower protection to try to make sure that, uh, you know, if whistleblowers want to get information from the government, they can and don't get fired and all that kind of thing. So a lot of the appropriations focus is on, is on those kind of things rather than outcome. There are a few things, though, um, where there are opportunities to focus on outcomes. In the accountability section, of the Recovery Act. Uh, it sets up this board that's uh, supposed to review uh, a lot of the information that comes back to the federal government for accountability purposes. And the board is supposed to review the reporting to see whether the reporting specifies the purpose of the contractor grant and measures of performance. So this board is supposed to be overseeing performance measurement as well as just, you know, was the money, did the money go out the door? The board's also supposed to be looking at, and what did we get for it? Uh, another piece of outcome focus uh, in the bill uh, is that it gives the President's Council of Economic Advisors the job of figuring out the effects of the bill on employment, economic growth, and other key economic indicators, depending on how uh, the President and the Council of Economic Advisors choose to interpret this term, other key economic indicators. Um, it's a great opportunity to look at a lot of important outcomes. Now, uh, the Office of Management and Budget got more specific when it issued guidance to agencies on February 18th on uh, how, to, how to begin implementing the Recovery Act and doing some of the spending. And there's a lot of stuff in there that, that uh, actually makes me pretty helpful. Hopefully, uh, hope, hopefully we can be helpful too, but 
the language makes me pretty hopeful. Outcomes are actually mentioned about three times in the OMB guidance, which is a good sign. And when agencies uh, put together their plans for Recovery Act spending, uh, they have to say what they're trying to accomplish. They have to uh, demonstrate cost effectiveness, state the expected public benefits in plain language. Uh, has to be understandable to the general public. That's pretty good. Um, and in addition, come on, Nico. This was great. To the extent possible, Recovery Act goals should be expressed in the same terms as programs goals in Departmental Government Performance Results and Results Act Strategic Plan. For, for those of you who don't follow um, Government Performance Results Act, GIPRA, there was a law passed in 1993. It requires agencies to produce long-term strategic plans where they explain what results they're trying to accomplish and how they measure that. They also have to produce an annual performance report each year that reports on how they're doing according to the measures that they have articulated for each of their major programs. And the administration is on record as saying, to the, you know, to the greatest extent possible, agencies ought to be using those measures for existing programs that they already have in place to assess how much additional outcome has, it, has occurred as a result of the spending in the Recovery Act. I mean, not only have they said use the same measures, but there's also language that I've detailed here later on that explicitly says we want agencies to use the same measures to the, to the maximum extent possible so that we can match up the additional spending with the additional results. This is great. This is great. And I'm, I mean, I'm not being sarcastic at all. This, people. I don't know too many people other than to get this excited over performance reporting issues. Um, but I mean, this is real. Somebody at OMB was really thinking, thinking about this. Um, I mean, people, actually implementing this is a bit of a challenge. And you know, if you talk to folks in federal agencies, they're still trying to figure out exactly what to do. But the concepts here are great. Essentially, they want to retain the measures that agencies use on the GIPRA and use those to measure the results of the results set. So that's a really good sign. And I've just got, what I've tried to do here is catalog any language in, the, um, in that OMB guidance that uh, seems to be related to outcomes. I'm not going to stand here and read all of this for you, but you've got it there in the slides as reference, and you can, you can actually go back and find it in the original document. So there's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff there saying, okay, let's use our GIPR measures for accountability under the Results Act. Which leads then to the next logical question, how good are the agency's measures that they have produced to comply with the Government Performance and Results Act? Well, you know what? We've got an answer for you. Because every year, since federal agencies have been required to produce annual performance reports, the first annual performance reports were produced in fiscal 1999, and every year since then, we've had a research team at the Mercatus Center that evaluates the quality of those performance reports, and every year we put out a scorecard uh, that, had, that ranks the agencies, and we give awards to the ones who do the best job in, in producing reports and so forth. Like last year, was it, was it Congressman Cooper or somebody else last year at our event who referred to it as the Emmy Awards of Performance Reporting? <laughs> and a couple of uh, our colleagues at the Mercatus Center, uh, Christina Forsberg and Stephanie Haff Haffelbalsch, who wrote, wrote our uh, this Mercatus on Policy piece, sat down to do a, a, a simple thing that I hadn't seen anybody else do, done, which is, Let's take the spending in the Recovery Act, the appropriations, and match it up with the quality of performance reporting based on what agency it's going to. And th this gives us cause for concern, because about three quarters of the spending in the Recovery Act is going to agencies that scored, uh, that earned a below satisfactory score in our annual evaluation of performance reports. Now, our evaluation is not evaluating the results the agencies produce. It's simply evaluating the transparency and the quality of their reporting on outcomes. So the only thing we're measuring is, can you, can you tell from the agency's report what outcomes they're producing and how much? We're not making a policy judgment as to whether government ought to be doing those things or shouldn't ought to be doing those things, whether those programs are good, whether they're bad. We're simply asking, is the quality of reporting good? So that then people who want to have an open, honest debate about whether the results were worth the money can actually look and say, okay, well, here's what we got. Let's compare it with what we spent and decide. And it looks like about three quarters of them, or three quarters of the spending in the Recovery Act is going to agencies who report, whose reports weren't that good last year, fiscal 2007. 
Uh, we'll have a new scorecard out in May that looks at fiscal 2008, and we'll redo this calculation to see if anything changes. About uh, what's the total? About 15 percent. You know, full this full transparency and accountability maybe means you know an agency pretty <coughs> performance report, and about 15 percent of the spending is going to agencies. Uh, whose reports receive what we, what we call a very good rating, you know, the, the top ones, the top seven. Oh, that just summarizes some of that additional, some of what I just mentioned. Now, let's look at accountability for tax expenditures, the tax, the tax provisions in the Recovery Act. Well, there's a very short answer to this. Um, in the Senate Government, Governmental Affairs Report on the Government Performance Results Act of 1993, this is about the main thing we found that mentions tax expenditures in relation to GIPRA. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Senate Government of, Governmental Affairs Committee says, well, yeah, we expect that we will see performance measurement for tax expenditures. Uh, last year, in the last year of the, uh, the last budget <coughs> issued by the Bush administration, uh, in the analytical perspectives document, essentially they said, yeah, we're going to work together to try to figure out how to do this. Um, now, GIPRA was passed in 1993. That budget came out in 2000. Uh, 2008, so what is that? 15 years after GIPRA passed, essentially the federal government's made very little progress on any kind of outcome measures for tax expenditures. So the 200 billion sum of tax expenditures in the bill, we ain't going to have good outcome measures for that unless something improves real quick, real soon. Finally, there is the other spending um, in what's called Division B, some of which is going directly to states, some of which is flowing through departments. And um, in Division B, if you read through all this stuff, um, we found a number of cases where there's language in the bill that suggests that somebody needs to be looking at outcomes. I mean, that that's what Congress expects, that somebody's going to be measuring outcomes. And I've just cataloged all of this here. Under trade, trade adjustment assistance, uh, electronic health work, records, variety of other things. Again, you've got that in, in the handout for reference and so forth. Interesting question, though, that occurred to us is, does the OMB guidance document also apply to this money? Because on the one hand, the document says that it applies to all executive branch departments and agencies involved in the Recovery Act. <laughs> on the other hand, it mostly sounds like when they wrote it over at OMB, they were thinking about the appropriations not about this other spending in Division B. So it's not clear at this point if uh, the spending in Division B is also supposed to be uh, subject to the Government Performance and Results Act measurement or not. And finally, you know what, let me, let me jump over this issue of job, whether jobs are an outcome and we can come back to it in Q&A if folks are really interested in that. Let me just cut to the chase to get to our suggestions for, for this. First off, um, there's a bunch of agencies that do not produce really great performance reports. They certainly don't measure up to the promise of full transparency and accountability. Those need to improve ASAP if we're actually going to have full transparency and accountability for all of the spending in the Recovery Act. Uh, second suggestion uh, that we had is that uh, somebody, I presume the administration, oh, I guess if Congress wants to say something, that's fine too, ought to make sure that the spending that's in Division B of the Recovery Act is also evaluated according to agencies' GIPRA performance. <coughs> There's also some spending in Division B that just goes to states or goes other places. It doesn't necessarily flow through federal agencies. Somebody, maybe GAO or CBO, ought to be tasked with evaluating the outcomes from that spending. And as far as I know, for most of that spending in Division B, there isn't really a lot of explicit accountability mechanisms. Uh, finally, we need to get serious about having outcome-oriented performance measures for tax expenditures, uh, which we simply don't have uh, by a date certain. I would think that 15 years after, the, after a Senate committee report would be enough time to have something, but so far we don't. Uh, and finally, uh, on the issue of trying to figure out the employment aspects, the, the, the only thing I'll say about that is that figuring out the net employment effects of a bill like this is somewhat complicated. It requires more detailed analysis than simply counting the number of people hired to do particular jobs. And so that's the kind of thing that's really going to need to be left to the Council of Econ Economic Advisors or the Government Accountability Office or both uh, if we actually want a 
a good estimate of the net employment effects of the bill. Anyway, now that's our suggestions in sort of you know high high uh, pollutant public policy type language. The administration could do some of these on its own initiative. Congress could do some of these, and yeah, either through legislation or more realistically through you know the right committee chair says that he or she would really like to see such and such information, that kind of thing, request the GAO to a study on something or another. That's, that's all the high policy stuff. Now, the last magazine I subscribed to, back when I had time to read magazines, uh, the last subscription I canceled was uh, Mother Earth News, which is a magazine for people who want to kind of be independent and go off the electric grid and grow their own food and all this kind of stuff. And, and they used to have little articles about people who were actually doing this. And that section of the magazine was called Report from Them That's Doing It. Like what Jerry Reno is going to do is I'm talking about all this fancy policy stuff. Jerry is going to give you a report from them that's doing it, namely actual things that, that regular people are doing, some, some of which started at Mercatus, some of which started elsewhere, uh, intended to improve transparency and accountability uh, in, with some of the results that's been. Mark, thank you, Jerry. Well, so as Jerry is recovered from what says, uh, I'm going to talk to you about how agencies and states are going to be doing some actual reporting. So, you know, America is probably one of the most transparent countries in the world. And by transparency, what it means is that we have all sorts of disclosures. We have all sorts of uh, public records that require uh, documents uh, from all documents. So you think of uh, campaign finance uh, disclosures, and you think of uh, uh, how Congress votes. All these things are public, right? Expenditures, if you want to know how your government is spending money, you can find all this data. And it's available to you. The problem is, is to be really transparent, you have to, it has to be accessible. In today's day and age, accessible means online, right? You have to go to a basement on the hill, city hall, to get this data. That's not really transparent. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means to be online. So if you want to put online, what sort of uh, uh, criteria do we need to, to look at? The first is that it has to be time data. If the data is being reported online, but it's being reported a year after the fact, that's not very timely, not very useful, there's going to be a lack. So that's just one quick thing to, to consider. How much is, I mean, ideally we want real-time data. There's no reason why if you have a, a federal um, IT system that's collecting data that belongs to the public and that is public information, that it should be published in real time to the web. Right? So ideally we want it real time. So somewhere between real time and one year lies the answer and knowledge will figure that out. Uh, the other thing is, is that when we push data online, it has to be in a useful format. And so what does that mean? Well, first of all, it has to be searchable. And that, you think that, that goes without saying. You think you know everything on the web is searchable, but it really isn't. Um, there's things that can keep uh, data from being searchable. Uh, so for example, if, uh, and I'll show you an example pretty soon uh, about one of my favorite agencies I like to criticize, which is the FCC. I like to criticize their, their transparency. Because they will do things, for example, and I don't think it's malicious, I think it's just that they're not thinking about how to do it. They will take an official government document, say, a uh, notice of proposed rule, uh, where they're proposing a new regulation, and they will type it up in Word, or whatever word processing program they use, which is digital. Right? So they could just take that, publish it to the web, and it's searchable. But they don't. They print it out, and they put it on a scanner. They scan it, and they take that image PDF, and they put it online. Have you seen that? Uh, and when you have an image PDF, I'm sure you've seen some, some PDFs you can highlight, copy, and paste. Those are searchable. Um, some are just images. Right? So that's not searchable. Also, if you have a database um, that uh, has all of your data, but the only way you can look at the database is by going to the field and typing in a query, Google can't look at any of that. No commercial search engine can look at it. There's some legislation that's looking to, to fix some of that. So the number one thing is searchable. The second thing is structure. Right? And how many of you here, by any chance, use uh, uh, RSS readers, like Google Reader or now I doubt So we <laughs> um, So if you go to the New York Times, um, you can read their web page and you have the home page. And every, just about every page on the web, from a news organization, every blog certainly, has what's called RSS feed. So there is a feed of broad data that is available to you. And if you do something that's called a news reader, I recommend you all go and check out Google Reader, which is really good. Um, you can subscribe to, let's say, the New York Times homepage. page. 
and then you never have to visit the New York Times ever again. And every morning when you turn on your newsreader, uh, you're going to get whatever has been published on that home page. Now, getting the home page probably isn't very useful. What, what's useful is, is that you can subscribe to just the automotive section, right? And you never have to visit the New York Times again. Whenever they publish an automotive, a, a paper, an article on the automotive section, you're alerted to that. Even better, you subscribe to a particular author if you like, a, a reporter, or maybe you subscribe to a particular keyword. Say you subscribe to uh, Columbia, and then whenever an article about Columbia or related to Columbia is published, whether it's in the automotive section, the business section, wherever it may be, you're going to get that. Right? Imagine if you could subscribe uh, to a keyword at EPA or uh, Superfund. Right? Wouldn't that be uh, interesting? So the way I like to describe um, structure, which really uh, my techie friends would probably criticize me for simplification, so I'll take this completely apart, uh, is think of a spreadsheet. Right? If I asked you to disclose, uh, if you're an agency you spent a billion dollars on something, and I asked you to disclose how you spent that money, you could write me a report in prose that dis discloses absolutely in every detail how you spent the money. You could also write a haiku that discloses it completely. Right? Not very useful to me uh, in a structured sort of way. If you gave me spreadsheets, right, I could then sort by the different columns. I could sort by um, the amount of money being spent. I could sort by contract, right? Show me all the contract and all the order. Show me the zip codes, right? You can sort. So that's what structured means. It's not a spreadsheet per se, but it's like a spreadsheet. Um, so I was going to show you some examples of uh, good and bad websites, government websites, and I think I'm going to skip that just in the interest of time. Uh, for a good website, I was going to show you Change.gov, which was the Obama administration's transition team website, and they took um, a lot of commentary and suggestions from folks while the transition was happening. Every document that they received, they published online immediately and they offered fees for people to subscribe to and see, and they did it by category, uh, in that sense. The bad example I was going to show you is the SEC um, website, um, and I'm not going to do it. It's tempting as it is, but <laughs> there's no full text search. Right? If the example I gave is President Obama out in California reading the newspaper that the FCC is considering uh, regulating the uh, content. You say, boy, I want to know about this. I want to read regulation. Um, maybe I want to put my own comment in there. So you go to the FCC website, you finally get to the screen where you can find proposed regulations. There is no full text search. There's nowhere where you can search for video games. You have to know the document number. Now, I might know the document number as a, you know, somebody who researches this, who all lobbyists interested in the video game industry certainly will know this document number. Mom out of California isn't going to know that. Uh, there is no structured feed, obviously. They do things like publish unsearchable documents, etc. So, just that way. So, um, what happens when you provide a useful format that has all these components that I described? Well, not only does it find the data, which is huge, right? And you have to consider that the way most Americans find data is through commercial search engines, through Google, Amazon Live, and Live. Not only can Americans find the data, but they can take the data and do interesting things with it. They can sort it quite simply. Right? They can also do what's called mashups, right? Take different uh, data sets and mash them together to create a new data set that's even more interesting and useful. Let me give you a quick example of this. Um, so Craigslist is the place to go to if you are looking for a, uh, a rental apartment or a house. Um, you know, now that newspapers sort of don't do that, and you have a place to go and go. You have to go to Craigslist. So here's the DC Craigslist. Now we go to housing. Um, I'm going to go to apartments and housing. And so this is what you get when you go to Craigslist. Um, it's very useful because if you come here, you see all of the listings in DC that are up for rent. Now the problem is, if you look at this, the first one is for uh, Coopin I don't know where that is, uh, Rockville, Alexandria, Bristol, Fairfax. Right? I mean, there's no, there's no order to these. It's just the order that they are added to the database by users or submitting sites, right? So I, I really want an apartment with DuPont Circle. So I need to go through and look at all of these. Okay. Well, there's a guy uh, out in San Francisco, moved out to San Francisco. His name is Paul Rademacher. And uh, he moved out there uh, in the early 2000s. And he needed to find an apartment. And he was going through the site. It was very frustrating. He just wanted to look at listings in this particular neighborhood. 
how to find it is, and this really is a problem because he knew that Craigslist offers an RSS feed of this data, right? A structured feed that you can sort. And you also need a Google Maps offer the API, an application program interface, that allow people to plot things on Google Maps. So he created a site called housingmaps.com. Well, you can imagine what I'm going to show you, right? You look up a map of DC, and plotted on the map are going to be all the listings. And you can just zoom in to the neighborhoods you're interested in, and click on them, and the listings come up with pictures of the apartments and everything. Okay? So you, tell, you have two data sets. Google Maps and Craigslist, and uh, each standing alone are pretty valuable, but this new mash this combination, housing maps, is more valuable than either standing alone. Right? And so if you offer all sorts of data uh, online, it can be really useful. Uh, check it out. So what's an example of this with government data? Um, so Vivek Kundra, who was the CTO of Washington, D.C., Appointed CIO of the United States in this administration, but a fantastic job in DC um, and created what we call what he calls the uh, DC data catalog. And what the DC data catalog is, is sort of what I was talking about before. DC is a matter of course of all these different government entities. As a matter of course, DC collected in its, in its IT system tons of information. So uh, every time that there was an arrest record was created, a police officer would enter it into a database. Right? This is all the information. Every time that somebody called in a pothole or a, red, uh, or a, a street light that wasn't working, um, that goes into a database. This is all public information. So what the VEC and the uh, office of, uh, chief technology officer in DC, quite simply, is just put a pipe between all these data systems that belong to the people, the information that is public, straight out to the VEC. And you created what's called the and look at all the different feeds that are available for folks to take and mix and match and look at. You have juvenile arrest charges, you have uh, Hanson service requests, uh, public space permits, registered property, registered vacant property. I know for a fact that you can have both of them So you can imagine. <coughs> you can imagine things you can do with this. Um, not only did they did this, they also followed a contest that they called Apps for Democracy, where they said, we've made all these feeds available, software developers, web developers, do something interesting with them and submit it to this conference. And I'm going to judge by visitors to a website, um, get a small prize and some recognition. And you've got some really interesting results. Um, you had one that I particularly, particularly like that is um, it's called Read the People Wiki. And what it does is, is that for every uh, report of, say, a street line out or a crime incident, it creates a wiki page. So citizens can then go on that page and keep the government hands and follow up. Has this been fixed? Right. And they can type in as an example. So this is what's possible. Um, I want to show you something that I did with some developers. Um, so back in November, December, when the president elected at that point and Congress were considering doing this big stimulus bill, um, there was a lot of consternation that perhaps it wasn't there weren't enough um, shovel ready projects enough of them to actually physically spend all this money that they wanted to spend. And uh, mayors and localities around the country said, no, 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 no. We've, got, we've got tons of projects that we need to uh, fund. Um, let, let's tell you. And so the U.S. Conference of Mayors did a survey of all the different localities around the country that are members of this conference and said, what projects would you do you have ready to go if only you had funds for these? And so mayors submitted these. And quite to their their credit, um, the U.S. Conference of Mayors published this publicly uh, in, a, in a sort of useful way. Um, uh, it basically, it was a list of about 10,000, like over 10,000, actually close to 20,000, 20, uh, projects that were shovel ready. And they were, if you think of the spreadsheet sort of idea, it was um, project name, city, state, was amount needed, uh, and the number of jobs estimated, etc. And so I saw this, and the colleague brought to my attention, and he said, this is an opportunity to take these ideas we've been working on and do something with them. So I logged in, and I asked for some help, some software developers volunteered, and uh, nice a weekend, and so of course, 
things. We created something called a stimulus watch. And what it does quite simply is we brought in all of these proposed projects into a database that now citizens can come to and they can search and they can find. Uh, so let me give you an example of how a citizen might use it. The private front page, you can see the most active today. You can see all the time most active, most expensive, so it's just sorted by cost. Uh, most critical and least critical is based on folks. So a citizen coming to visit this site and say, you know, I want to know what sort of projects are proposed for my neighborhood, for my area. Uh, so Jerry, you're from Ohio, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's click here and search by state or city. <coughs> So we're going to find Ohio. Okay, there are 847 projects proposed in Ohio.
gave us the data we were able to use. We want to build a stimulus watch 2.0 that displays projects that are actually funded, right? And so once the recovery.gov site gets going, and I'm not going to have time to talk about this now, but please um, uh, come see my testimony on Thursday for the House Oversight Committee, where I'll be talking exactly what's missing right now from recovery.gov. Uh, I guess there's nothing there now. Uh, but what, what can the folks running recovery.gov, what can they do to help the big community of folks who want to build tools like this uh, to get ready for it? So you want to build this. You want to build a, a, a Simplex Watch 2.0 where you actually find a project that is going on in, in your community and uh, where you can see every contract related to that project, right? And so if, you, if you've got a wiki, you've got a comment section, you have local knowledge, you can say, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so this is a bridge that's being built. I, and I see that it's going to Acme. Let's say that one of the contracts is for concrete, and it's going to Acme uh, Concrete. And I know that this is a firm that's owned by the mayor's son-in-law. Uh, I can note it here. Right? This may or may not be useful. Right? But when we sort, when we come up here, you know, we, we also would like to have a uh, sort of voting mechanism. I'm not sure what the question is going to be yet. It might be something like, are you satisfied with this project? Yes, or no. Um, but when we, when we sort, Let's look at least critical because it's more fun than most. Most critical is just a lot of boring projects. It's not very fun. Uh, when you look at least critical, um, you see some amazing stuff like golf courses, dog parks, uh, that go for money. Well, in 2.0, when we're actually looking at money, the way it's being spent, it's like a way to fly some information that IGs around the country can use. Right? They investigate the news, do further investigation. So we want to build that, but we need real data. We need a timer. Fashion, and we need it in a structured form. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Well, let's thank our panelists for spending time. so everyone in the room can hear your question. I'm sure there's a lot of good ones out there. And also before you leave, if you could just fill out our survey and uh, take a moment to do that. It would be great to see you.
uh, having cleaned the mess up, we don't want it to happen again. And in different places, there have been different reasons. Anybody else? If not, thank you. If we can make a plea to you, please see if you can get raw data uh, included as one of the things that we would like to see up on websites, because then we can do the things that Jerry's talking about. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, historical.